Hello, and welcome to today's Thor Labs webinar, Understanding Laser-Induced Damage. My name is Matt, and today I will be moderating the talk. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the talk, please don't hesitate to ask them. You can utilize the Q&A icon in the upper right corner. It looks like uh, two speech bubbles um, to ask questions during the talk, and we will address them at the end. Our speaker today is Michael Gartman. He is an optical design engineer in Thor Labs Advanced Photonics Division. In this role, his responsibilities include prioritizing and coordinating testing of parts for laser-induced damage thresholds, as well as monitoring the literature in this field to facilitate maintaining an in-house knowledge base on the subject. From a background in physics, Michael started at Thor Labs over 12 years ago and is continuing to release catalog and custom products as well as serving as one of our in-house laser damage subject matter experts. With that said, I'll let Mike take it off. All right, thanks very much, Matt. And uh, I'm Mike Gartman, and I'm going to be talking to you today about understanding laser-induced damage. So let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, the agenda here today is, um, yeah, what is laser damage threshold and what forms does it take? the different damage threshold regimes and mechanisms of damage, which include the nanosecond pulse regime, the continuous wave or CW regime, and the ultra fast regime, which is typically picosecond and femtosecond pulses. We'll also be looking at what influences laser induced damage threshold and why, how testing is performed, including an overview of the ISO setup. And then finally, we're going to look at uh, the scaling considerations that you'll see uh, when you're not exactly at the test parameters. Um, so yeah, this first uh, in this first slide, you can see some uh, laser damage to a substrate. This, these are um, test marks. Um, this is test damage on a particular coating. Uh, each one of those roughly circular uh, damage points is about 300 microns in diameter. And uh, there's, you can see 10 of them, although they they extend off the screen. So um, as for what laser damage is, this is any irreversible change in optical characteristics of a component, and that's caused by a sufficiently intense laser. Um, some of these can be benign, and some of these, like what you're seeing on the screen, is obviously less so. And uh, as for who should be concerned about it, that would be anyone designing, operating, or using a high-power laser. Um, and that's um, just to be able to avoid and or mitigate any issues there. Um, you know, some coatings or optical materials are going to have health hazards or, um, you know, on a slightly lower stakes level, um, we just want to avoid uh, downtime and uh, unnecessary damage to work pieces. So you really have to be, this is something you should be aware of. Um, so uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, uh, as far as forms and effects of laser damage, this can range, you know, from pits um, induced in um, in the coating to melting or shattering of the bulk substrate. And over here on the right, you can see that we uh, we got some damage to the coating, which kind of propagated to the substrate. And you can see some uh, you can see some cracking here. I mean, this almost looks like somebody's profile in that uh, you know, here's the skull, here's a nose, and here's an eye. But you know. We, uh, as cool as these things sometimes look, we do prefer to avoid them. Um, and yeah, any of these, anything like that, you know, pits, cracking, shattering can change um, reflectance or transmission characteristics of your optics, which, you know, is, tends to be something you want to avoid, um, or it can lead to an increased absorption or scattering, which again is something you want to avoid. And uh, as for what this is dependent on, it's a very large variety of factors. Um, and uh, I have some of those listed there, and it's it's influenced by the substrate that you're using, the coating deposition method, the coating materials, and then uh, all the characteristics of your laser. So there is a, a lot to consider here. And uh, for some of these factors, some scaling or uh, other considerations are possible, but unfortunately, we are not able to or we are not able to test under all possible use conditions. But we can usually give you a ballpark answer if, if you're curious. And uh, yeah, as far as the effects uh, of laser damage, uh, as I said before, this can negatively affect your reflection or your transmission, and it can also um, do bad things to your wavefront or your beam profile. I'm sure you can imagine, uh, you know, looking at this, what a beam passing, what a nice Gaussian beam passing through that is going to look like afterwards. It's certainly not going to be uh, what you want. 
So that's, um, yeah, what is laser-induced damage threshold and what forms does it take? That's uh, a brief overview and a primer there. So uh, after this, we're going to move on to the different regimes and the mechanisms of damage there. Um, so uh, the most important th takeaway I would say here is that results cannot be scaled between regimes just because um, you have, say, uh, a nanosecond damage threshold that is not going to govern how uh, the part is going to behave um, in um, either the CW regime or in the femtosecond regime. So just please bear that in mind. So uh, the majority of our tests have been performed in the nanosecond regime, and that's with uh, 10 nanosecond pulses and at 10 hertz. Um, we've done some percentage of our testing um, in the CW regime because uh, we do have demand there. And we've done a small amount of testing in the ultra-fast uh, picosecond and femtosecond regime. And that's typically with um, about 100 femtosecond uh, pulses and at about one kilohertz. Um, obviously, there are lasers outside of these regimes, but um, we find that for the most of our customers, they're working in one of these three. And uh, over here on the right, you can see, um, so this is damage in the, from a, a nanosecond pulse laser. And you can see that that's a relatively fine, relatively uniform circular spot. And that's typically what you're going to see in the pulse regime. Whereas uh, in contrast, in the CW regime, you can see this is very much burned and uh, melted into the substrate. And this is, uh, this is an effect of, you know, the different mechanisms at work in these two separate regimes, which uh, I'm going to get into in a second. Um, so yes, we've done the majority of our testing, approximately two thirds of the parts that uh, I'm aware of has been in the nanosecond regime. And again, this is um, due to a focus of customer demand, customer demand in that area. Um, as far as uh, the results of that, uh, in general, um, the nanosecond regime uh, damage threshold is driven by defects. And these are inclusions or inhomogeneities either in the coating or in the substrate itself. And these are caused by um, either, you know, um, these are either inherent, you know, in the substrate, because obviously any substrate you get is going to have, um, you know, some remnants from the crucible it was grown in or some remnants from uh, the optical polish that was used to prepare it. Um, whereas uh, coating and homogeneities are typically driven by cleanliness of chamber, purity of materials, um, depth of vacuum, all that, uh, all that stuff. Um, so these inclusions or inhomogeneities can be ejected at lower power occasionally without damaging um, the coating if the coating is not particularly dense. So for this reason, you tend to get the best results uh, in the nanosecond regime from uh, electron beam deposited coatings because they're, they're dense enough to give you good uniformity and a repeatable performance, but, but they're not as dense as some of the sputtered coatings. So uh, you can eject the material from them without you know, having uh, that nodule blow out or cause a major issue. Um, these results are reported in joules per centimeter squared, and that's calculated from the energy per pulse of the laser, as well as the spot size. And uh, for a reasonably large spot size, this should be relatively spot size independent, um, assuming you, you're in probably at least 100, 200 microns. And this can be scaled with wavelength, pulse width, and with rep rate, uh, obviously within limits, which we're going to uh, be getting to later in the presentation. Um, so just then as an example, um, damage threshold scares approximately with the square root of pulse width from 50 nanometers to about, um, excuse me, 50 nanoseconds to about 100 picoseconds. And uh, you typically don't want to scale more than one order of magnitude there, but this can be used just to give you a ballpark idea of what to expect. And uh, this can be valid, you know, potentially up to a microsecond, but we try and stay in uh, in the region laid out there. Um, yeah, next we have uh, the CW regime where we have uh, performed a variety of tests. And um, in the CW regime, results are typically absorption driven. So this, um, this absorption can be either defect related um, because again, I'm sure you can imagine some of the particles that I mentioned on the previous slide, um, whether they're from uh, polish or from uh, inclusions in the coating, um, will be less um, less robust than uh, than what's intended to be there. Um, but this uh, this can also be intrinsic to the material. For example, um, 
you know, something like germanium is not uh, has a uh, will undergo some heating as you uh, as you pass a laser through it, just because it has uh, you know a decently high um, coefficient of uh, of extinction there. Um, so CW um, damage is less of a concern in materials with lower absorption, but you know it's always it is typically something you should be aware of because obviously nothing has. Uh, Obviously, very few things have a, essentially no absorption. Just we can we try and drive it low, but it's always there. Um, these results are reported in watts per centimeter, and that's from laser power and beam diameter. Um, this isn't in watts per centimeter squared, which um, many of us are used to looking at. And this is because um, the uh, damage threshold scales um, with watts per centimeter rather than um, rather than with watts per centimeter squared. And you can see an example of this in the below table. Um, so if you have yeah, 30 watt laser at the smallest spot diameter I have there, which is 0.3 millimeters, um, and you scale with the watts per centimeter, you will safely scale um, with the damage threshold. But you can see that uh, you have with, uh, if you use the beam area in, uh, in this column, that you will rapidly have much more power than the part uh, failed at. And obviously that's something you want to avoid. Um, and uh, just something I do want to keep in mind is that uh, for higher rep rate lasers, and here we're typically talking about a kilohertz rep rate or above, uh, you might want to consider just looking at the CW damage threshold if it's available and comparing it to the average power of the laser. Because um, as you can imagine, you, might see, you will see similar heating behaviors. Um, just because um, you know, if the as the laser comes in at repeated pulses at a high rep rate, that does tend to produce a similar thermal load to a CW beam. So something to keep in mind. Uh, next, we have a uh, Pico and Femto second regime, and you can see um, here that these are some uh, very tightly and finely drilled holes, and that's. Um, Basically, the short with shorter pulse widths, um, you tend to be able to get um, cleaner ablation and um, and better uh, better drilling. And that's because at shorter pulse lengths, there's less time to diffuse heat into the substrate, so you're just getting pure ablation. There's less melting, um, which is why Pico and Femto second lasers are often used for material processing. Um, anyway, we have done some small amount of testing in this region, again, at, um, at customer demand. And these results, like the nanosecond regime, are reported in joules per centimeter squared. Um, so one interesting thing about the ultra fast regime is that a uh, damage threshold is driven less by defects, although obviously defects are, are a concern and more about um, the, um, the intrinsic properties of the coating. So uh, basically you want your coating to be to resemble the bulk material as much as possible. Um, and that's the bulk material. Um, that's as if um, the coating itself was a bulk material. So you want to use something that's going to give you a thick, robust film. Um, so you tend to get uh, better results in this region if you use uh, sputtering, whether that's ion beam or magnetron. Um, and this tends to be a little more deterministic because uh, because of that, which is uh, which is nice because, uh, yeah, we we would rather have a deterministic than a stochastic process in this instance. Um, so next, let's look at uh, the mechanisms. So first, I uh, I want to play this brief animation for you, which is kind of a timeline of effects of what happens as a laser pulse is impingent upon a material, and that's um, you know immediate, almost essentially immediately, and we're talking. Um, that looks like uh, approximately a femtosecond, we're getting electron photo excitation, and then we get some of these other processes occurring, and I'm gonna, going to get into them in a second. Um, so basically, when, you, when a laser is in, uh, impinges upon a component, um, you get some excitation of the electron volume. And uh, in nonmetals, uh, the conduction band is empty, and what we're going to do is we're going to drive the, the electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. And that is going to result in, um, in some of these effects happening because uh, we're going to start seeing some localized absorption. So, um, you know, first, you know, we're going to see photoionization, then we're going to see avalanche ionization followed by dielectric breakdown, and, and then that's going to be followed by heating. And that 
you can see that um, that is reflected in this in the graph where we see multi-photon ionization occurring relatively soon after the impact of uh, of the light and then you're you're going to get avalanche ionization you're going to get the electron phonon collisions that i just referenced and then you're going to get um, defect generation and ablation of the structure um, you're not going to start to get thermal effects uh, until about a picosecond after um, after the laser is there so this is why uh, as i referenced earlier you're going to see um, less heating from the shorter pulses um, so in the ultra fast regime that is the pico and the femtosecond uh, processes you're going to you're going to worry about uh, photoionization as avalanche ionization uh, in the nanosecond regime you know most of the damage is typically going to be caused by dielectric breakdown and then finally in the cw regime you are going to see heating um, and for longer pulse trains you can see um, heating contribute uh, to any of these but you know typically when you're getting the results quickly it's going to go in that order um, so as far as uh, our components we have performed a testing we've performed testing on a large number of our components um, that's both catalog and custom optics that's ranging from the ultraviolet at uh, the quadrupled YAG at 266 to uh, CO2 lasers at 10.6 microns and we've done this testing at a variety of pulse lengths and rep rates, uh, pulse lengths and rep rates excuse me and this has been mostly in the nanosecond and CW regimes and uh, we tend to do this um, both to qualify our coding chambers in-house as well as qualify outside coding vendors because we want to ensure uh, product line uniformity. If you buy, uh, say, a silver mirror from us today, it should perform similarly to that same mirror you bought three years ago. Um, and we do this for many new products because uh, as our colleagues in tech support will be glad to tell you, that is one of the, the most common questions they get. So we try and have uh, a ready answer for them there rather than just shrugging our shoulders. Um, we're also able to test parts on customer request, um, whether that's, you know, hey, I bought this this one beam splitter, what's the damage threshold to uh, larger OEM requests where um, a customer needs a particular power level for a component. And we can uh, we could certainly set something like that up. And uh, while we haven't tested everything we sell because we do sell a large and wide variety of components, many of the parts we've tested um, have, an have other analogs that we can compare them to. So we are typically have a ballpark value for many components. Um, and uh, while we do not test every coding run, we do test common components regularly. And again, that's to ensure product line uniformity. We wouldn't want to you know, move a mirror from one chamber to one of our other chambers and then um, realize months later that we get a worse damage threshold performance. So we, we do that as part of the qualification process uh, before parts go on the shelf. And again, uh, we are responsive to customer feedback because you know, many of our customers uh, do want to know, you know what power can this particular part withstand. So um, here we have a number of products that we've tested. Um, this is a, a beam splitter cube. And uh, if you look carefully, you can see this damaged spot that's on uh, the uh, cemented hypotenuse interface uh, rather than one of the four uh, exit faces. And uh, that's because um, you know, for this particular beam splitter cube, um, the the lowest damage threshold uh, surface is going to be that central interface because it's cemented. So many optical cements are obviously not quite as uh, high power as uh, as the AR coatings. So uh, yeah, we want to be sure that we're testing the part of the component most likely to fail. You know, if uh, if for example this beam splitter cube fails at five joules per centimeter squared at the cemented interface, you're not going to care if the AR fails at ten. You know. Um, then below we have a wave plate. Uh, you can see the line of holes um, basically running from 12 to 6 there. Um, our wave plates are one of our uh, higher damage threshold components and you know we ensure that with uh, some uh, some strict cl cleanliness as well as um, with uh, V-coats which are um, just uh, relatively tight uh, narrow band coatings that have a high damage threshold. And up here you can see um, this is actually um, the rear ground surface of a of a witness sample, and that's um, we actually had damage to the backside from uh, from the laser impinging on the front side. Um, there's also damage on the front, but you can't uh, you can't see it just in this photo. Um, so yeah, let's let's move on. 
Um, so that was an overview of the different regimes and the mechanisms there. And uh, next, we're going to move, in, move on to what influences uh, damage threshold and why. I've, I've touched on some of that, but let's, let's try and get a little more in depth. Um, so one of the big influences here is uh, material and surface finish. Um, just because, uh, yeah, a lot of the light is interacting with the coating, you know, even for a mirror, it doesn't mean that the, the surface can't be an issue. You can see here, um, we have uh, what is catastrophic damage to a substrate. You you can see uh, the coating damaged, and then you know this is this is literally a hole in the glass. So that's uh, obviously you know much worse for uh, component integrity than just uh, you know some damage to the coating. Um, so typically, um, fused silica is the material of choice uh, for a lot of the work in the visible and the near infrared. Um, Hydroxyl, hydroxyl free is available for some applications because uh, it does have uh, some absorption bands in the near IR and telecom region. Um, I mean, fused silica has the advantage of it's available relatively cheaply and in relatively large pieces, and it's easily polished to uh, a high surface quality. And that's both um, in terms of surface finish, that is good scratch dig, as well as uh, low surface roughness. Um, both of which can contribute. So we're going to look at that here. Um, typically, you want a lower number for scratch dig. Um, you know, 10.5 is preferable to 40.20. 40.20 is better than 60.40, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, uh, obviously, we would st we strive to make defect-free surfaces, but you know, some defects in in terms of laser damage are are worse than others. Um, if you have a 45 degree base angle in the center of the aperture, that's going to be problematic. If you have a very light scratch um, outside of the clear aperture, that's probably not going to be an issue. And um, the reason the 45 degree base angle is going to be less than ideal is that's going to uh, have some focusing effects um, and that's something to avoid. Uh, as far as surface roughness, um, yeah, you want something with low uh, surface roughness and uh, little to no subsurface damage because and uh, you want to avoid embedding uh, polishing compound or material into the surface. Um, a lot of those compounds are uh, non-optical materials or are materials with relatively high absorption um, in many common at many common uh, laser wavelengths. So again, something to avoid. Um, one uh, one factor that's occasionally overlooked is going to be surface preparation prior to coating and. As I put it in the PowerPoint, you know, why uh, why polish anything well if you're just going to um, if you're not going to clean it or if you're going to fingerprint it before it goes in the chamber? You know, if you're going to compromise its performance, so you have to make sure anything going into the chamber is clean. Uh, and then there's a number of uh, things to take into account with uh, with the coating. I mean, first uh, you're going to want to look at the design. Um, something like electric field intensity is um, often overlooked, but you can dramatically uh, change uh, the laser induced damage threshold of, a, of an optic by manipulating the electric field intensity. Um, so depending on the coating design, um, you know, your electric field is going to have peaks and, uh, and troughs as it, you know, propagates through the coating. And uh, if, you, uh, if you have those peaks occur at, a, at an interface, whether that's between, you know, Two of the materials, whether that's high and low, or low and medium, or medium and high, that's that's a negative. Or if you have a, a peak in a, one of the higher index materials, that's also going to be a problem. So if you can, um, yeah, if you can manipulate your electric field to uh, to peak in the the uh, lower index layers, or as I'm going to get into shortly, the uh, layer with the better band gap, you're going to have better results and. You know, if you look in the literature, you can see this can be an order of magnitude, which is obviously very significant. Um, you know, next you're going to want to select uh, coating materials that have a uh, high damage threshold. For example, uh, um, if you use Niobe as your high index material, you may have a very nice coating, but you're not typically going to have great uh, laser damage threshold performance. Um, in general, uh, you're going to want to use silica as the low uh, as the low index material. And then for the high index material, you're going to want to choose between uh, one of these others on this chart. And laser damage threshold does tend to scale a little roughly with band gap. So, you know, hafnia 
is a good material to use. It's typically it's better than tantala or titania or niobia. Um, and again, this is in the, the visible deer infrared uh, in some of the other uh, wavelength regimes. You may want to look at other materials. Um, but unfortunately, um, as you can see, we have a rough trend of uh, lower band gap with higher index. And as any coding designer can tell you, you want to um, have a large contrast between your high and your low index layers. So this kind of leads to uh, almost a rock, paper, scissors uh, type of game when it comes to design and the coding, because you want something that has a, a high damage threshold, but you also want something that's less complex and uh, less complex equals less layers. So uh, yeah, there are trade-offs to be made there. Um, but yes, damage threshold isn't necessarily defined by band gap, but it's that's a good proxy to look at. Um, as we briefly touched upon before as well, uh, different deposition methods can influence your damage threshold results. Um, you're typically going to want to use um, an electron beam uh, deposition if you're working in the nanosecond regime because uh, the nanosecond regime is defect driven and you're typically going to want to use sputtering in the picosecond and femtosecond regime because this is driven by the bulk properties of the coating and uh, you're also going to want to ensure that the part stays clean um, between the time it's coated and uh, when you place it in your system so that's um i've touched on what influences uh, damage threshold and why and uh, now we're going to look at testing uh, how it's performed so uh, as far as uh, testing, there are a number of different protocols. Um, most, many of them are governed uh, by this particular ISO standard, which uh, you are certainly welcome to read and familiarize yourself with. Um, these include the one-on-one -on -one test, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's one uh, laser damage shot per site, or one laser shot per site, and this tends to produce the highest values. Um, unfortunately, um, at least, it, any setup I've worked in, you know, where we want to use more than one shot per laser. So one-on-one uh, -on -one is typically not the best uh, method to look at, but it's it's available. Um, so um, one of uh, the S on one test um, addresses that particular um, that particular drawback of the one-on-one -on -one test because uh, what it uses is a constant number of shots per site. You know, typically I've seen 10, 20, or 100. Um, and this is multiple shots at the same fluence or power level. And then um, if uh, no damage occurs, then more sites are picked and the sequence is repeated at a, a higher fluence or power level. This tends to produce lower, but results that are probably more in line with much, much how most users are using the parts. Um, than the one-on-one, -on -one, excuse me. And then um, I believe the ISO standard also covers damage certification, which is just, you know, will this part take this amount of power and or energy? And that's a pass-fail test. So that's relatively simple. Um, there are a number of tests uh, described in the literature that I don't believe are governed by the ISO standard. Um, so one of those is the R on one test. This is similar to the S on one test, but, um, the, uh, but this is focused on the same site, so the power is going to be ramped um, until damage is reached rather than hitting one site, seeing no damage and moving on to another site. Um, there's also the raster scan test, which is um, typically performed over some subsection of the aperture, and that's, um, uh, yeah, that's going to produce some overlapping sites. Um, there is continuing research on this um, because uh, due to some of the drawbacks in the ISO standard and just some of uh, some of the issues that have come up with um, trying to harmonize results between uh, multiple testing houses or laboratories over the years. Um, so uh, I know there's a group working on that uh, right now. Uh, I know there are, uh, and there are a number of uh, a number of papers describing their um, what they're doing in the literature. I mean, I can briefly attempt to touch on it just. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not involved in this group, so if I uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll try not to lead you too astray. But I believe it's trying to make uh, make the testing more deterministic um, using a flat top beam and trying to uh, ensure that it's more of a pass fail type test at a particular um, power or energy level um, rather than and that's some of that is using the flat top beam and some of that is. Uh, just ensuring um, good calibrations across uh, across laboratories and but yeah I will 
I'm certainly glad to point you in the right direction if you're a little more, uh, if you're, if you want a little more information on that. And uh, yeah, there are a number of testing houses worldwide um, who we have uh, good relationships with, and you know, as far as I know, they all, all their uh, work is traceable through ISO. Um, so let's look at a, a typical laser damage uh, setup. Uh, obviously, number one, you need a laser system. Um, then you need a variable attenuator in order to uh, ensure that uh, you're not operating at zero or 100 percent power. You need to be able to vary the power in order to get the damage. Um, then you're going to have um, you know, some series of wave plates to get whatever arbitrary polarization is needed on the sample. Um, you know, some parts are are going to have um, yeah, some parts are polarization sensitive and you're going to want to test with a uh, with a particular polarization, whether that's P, S, circular, um, you know, some other linear. Uh, but yeah, you're going to need the wave plate for that. Um, you're going to need a focusing system because you're not typically testing with a raw beam. Um, you have a, a beam diagnostic unit, a uh, the specimen compartment, because uh, as I alluded to earlier, you probably don't want to be exposed to these uh, these parts as they're being damaged, and um, yeah, and, uh, some sort of damage detector, so you can see uh, a neat little animation of what's going on here. And uh, yeah, and this is um, this is obviously greatly simplified, but your typical uh, test apparatus is going to follow this general uh, this general format. Obviously, it's going to be a little more complicated. Um, so. One of the questions we often get is, yeah, how do we determine when a part is damaged? Well, something like this, you can pretty plainly see uh, there's a large crack in the optic, and that's, uh, you know, that's caused by, um, you know, you can see the optic is cemented in a ring. So uh, as uh, as the glass is heated, it's going to uh, it's going to expand, and in, in this case, it's bounded. So you know, we're uh, something has to give and in that case uh that's the glass here so unfortunately not all uh not all damage is necessarily this easy to detect because you know we want to keep our systems up and we want to determine if anything bad is happening before we see this so uh one thing to look for is a, a visible change in the surface whether that's color change deformation or burns um some of these can be benign um as uh, as i've referenced uh, earlier, you're going to see, um, you may see ejection of some particles um, if you're working in the nanosecond regime. And, um, you know, some of those that will cause a color change to your uh, to your optic. But if you're still seeing um, the performance you want, then, you know, you're probably not going to care too much. Um, obviously, physical deformation or burns are a little different. And, yeah, you maybe in some cases you can move to a different part of the optic and won't have the issue, but yeah, those are typically uh, problematic. Um, also, parts are uh, often inspected with a uh, Namarsky DIC uh, uh, microscopy, and that's um, that's just to get a good contrast and high zoom. Um, this can be done either um, in situ or um, or afterwards. Obviously, it's easier to have your damage detection be online rather than you know put some pulses on a part, remove it from the setup, check for damage, put it back in. So that's typically something to be avoided. Um, one other method is you can look for a scatter on the surface. And obviously any of these uh, pictures of damaged optics I've showed you would have significantly increased scatter over um, the undamaged coating. So that's, that's one method. Um, you can also look for a plasma spark, which is, um, I mean, that's just a bright flash that's going to be. Yeah, I mean, something like that can be detected, um, but like uh, like the color change that may occasionally not be problematic if you're, you know, ejecting a particle, you know, sometimes you will get a flash. But if uh, again, if the optic is still performing as it should be, you know, you may be uh, you may be able to keep using it. And of course, you can sometimes see catastrophic failure or you can in the case of this, it wouldn't surprise me if you could hear catastrophic failure. Um, so yeah, that's one other thing to keep an eye out for. Um, if you're not damage testing, if you're just operating a, a laser or a laser system, you know, if you see any of these, you know, that uh, that should put you on alert or um, decrease performance. Um, yeah, if you see 
suddenly, you know, I had a this nice system putting out, a, you know, a good looking Gaussian beam, and then suddenly your your beam starts looking a little deformed, or you start losing significant power. You know, you may have an issue. Uh, you may have an issue like this. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, as far as how damage threshold is determined, uh, here's a very brief overview of the testing process. Um, basically, at lower power levels, you know, if I direct, you know, a two milliwatt helium neon laser onto my surface, I'm not going to see any damage, no matter how long I do it for uh, on most optics. And uh, at a relatively high power levels, I am going to see everywhere I hit with uh, with the laser damage. And so. Uh, if you do something like that, you can get a curve. Uh, you, you can start to get data points like this and like this. And uh, as you modulate your power levels, you will eventually see um, some power levels where a percentage of your sites are damaging. You know, if you test 10 or 100 sites and you'll get something in here where, you know, uh, maybe 25% of your sites damage. Um, so once you get to those intermediate uh, power levels, you're going to want to, uh, yeah, try and get a few of those so you can uh, get a curve like that. And then uh, you're going to want to plot them like this. And uh, then you're going to want to draw a trend line uh, basically through the damaged sites and uh, where that trend line intersects uh, your X axis that is typically treated as the as the damage threshold. And usually um, in a curve like this, that's going to be relatively close to your um, uh, to the highest number you uh, you were able to test with zero percent damage. Um, you know, sometimes you may want to, um, um, you know, just build in a build in a safety factor there, um, and you know, cut some percentage off of that number. But um, you know, that is typically what is used, what is reported by most testing houses. Um, as far as testing considerations, there's there are a few. Um, a few things to keep in mind here. Uh, for one, laser damage is a statistical, not necessarily an absolute measurement. So obviously, you know, even if you're testing, you know, some portion of the surface, you can't sample the entire surface and you can't sample every defect. So uh, you will occasionally see failure at or below the damage threshold. Just, that's something to bear in mind. Um, one on run, one results may not be reducible in practice. Um, I think uh, I did touch on this before, and that's just because, yeah, you are going to get great results if you hit something once. But um, yeah, most of the optics I'm dealing with, we're going to want to use them for a longer period of time than one laser shot. So yeah, please bear that in mind. Um, repetitive testing can also cause conditioning. And this is um, similar to, uh, as I brought up before, um, the ejection of, uh, of defects. Um, so you can, if you do, if you do that, you can uh, eject some defects that would uh, cause the part to fail at higher power levels. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, one other, you also want to be sure that when you're testing a part, um, you know, obviously you may not, you're not testing something. Uh, this is a destructive test. So you're not testing what you're putting into your system. You're testing a sample. Uh, of what you're going to be putting into your system. So you're going to want to test something from the same coding run on the same substrate um, because, uh, yeah, as, as we mentioned, um, laser damage threshold can vary from coding run to coding run, and it's certainly going to vary um, on different substrates. So you want to be ensure that you want to ensure that what you're testing is is what you're planning on using to get the most accurate results possible. Um, and one other uh, one other issue, and this one is a little, um, little more esoteric, is uh, if you're planning on building your system in vacuum, you're going to want to test in vacuum, um, because uh, you know air is a much better convector of heat than a vacuum is. So uh, you're going to, and this is this has been well reported in the literature. You're going to see lower damage thresholds for parts in a vacuum. So bear that in mind. Test under the, your use conditions, or at least as close as possible. Um, you know, one question we do occasionally get is, can damage threshold be calculated in a theoretical sense? You know, I know this is my substrate. These are my coding materials. You know, can I just plug this all into a formula and get a number? And the answer is yes, but not really. Um, 
you can you can do that. You will get a number that's you know an order at least an order of magnitude higher than uh, than is typically tested, and uh, that's because these calculations are built based on the melting or catastrophic strain uh, to failure of a typical substrate, um, and you know you're going to see damaging effects long before that. Um, you know, in glasses you may get softening, in some crystals you get make make a disassociation. Um, yeah, and. Uh, you know, some of the numbers necessary to do these calculations are not necessarily easily obtained for your coating materials because, um, you know, a lot of um, a lot of parameters are well established in the literature for bulk substrates, but um, for coating materials, you know, your properties aren't necessarily going to be the same as the bulk for for a lot of these coating materials, and that's going to, that can even vary run to run or chamber to chamber uh, in one particular coating house. So uh, yeah, even if you can find some of the values in the literature, they're not necessarily going to work for you. And of course, this doesn't take into account uh, any surface effects or any of the defects uh, involved. So that's something, uh, yeah. So you can't really calculate this theoretically. And uh, here, I guess uh, we just wanted to show you, here's a retro reflector and you can see some damage uh, to the interior that's um that's on the back surface which has been gold plated uh, so let's move on so that's um how the testing is performed and uh, next we're going to look at scaling considerations and then after that uh, i believe i'll take some of your questions um so yeah i, I can certainly uh, say that uh one of the mo more common questions we get uh in our from our colleagues in tech support or to our colleagues in tech support is yeah, is scaling possible at all? Because, you know, we test parts under certain use conditions and for the customers who are working under these, those use conditions, this is great, but not everybody is working under our exact test conditions. So, um, yeah, if you have a slightly different wavelength, can you, can you scale or can you just use that number or do you have to have the part tested again? And no, you don't necessarily have to have the part tested again if the wavelength is within a few percent a uh, few percentage points of our test wavelength and if the pulse and the repetition rates are relatively close. Um, so you can see uh, how this scaling can be performed there. Um, this isn't valid over any range where the absorption is going to change significantly or where the properties of the materials are going to change significantly. Um, so for example, we have you know 1064 to 1030 here and uh, something like that should be valid as long as there's no uh, as long as the material doesn't have a large absorption band at one or the other of those wavelengths, which for most of the materials we're typically using, uh, they don't. But you couldn't, for example, you know, scale apart tested at 1064 down to say 266 because uh, the properties are going to change significantly. And um, this particular uh, scaling may underestimate the damage threshold if you're scaling from a lower to a higher wavelength, which you know um, that you may not be able to use uh, your laser, which isn't quite as catastrophic as um, some of the other scaling issues, but just something to bear in mind. Um, obviously, if you're if you overestimate the damage threshold, that's much worse than if you underestimate. Um, as far as pulse width, um, this is going to depend if the material is absorbing or not. Um, this is typically quoted as approximately proportional to um, the root of uh, the pulse width for transmitting materials and this isn't um, this isn't an absolute um, you can find values in the literature with a, a lower exponent ranging from 0.35 to 0.45 and um, so this is valid from approximately 100 picoseconds to approximately 50 nanoseconds but uh, as i mentioned earlier yeah try not to scale more than an order of magnitude um, you know this will Otherwise, this can just give you a ballpark idea rather than, you know, it's this exact value and it has to be that. So that's that. Um, as far as repetition rate, this uh, should have minimal effects for um, non-absorbing materials. Um, for absorbing materials, you're also going to want to look at uh, the CW uh, damage threshold for the average power. And, um, but, uh, yeah, for some absorbing materials, you will see that uh, 
repetition rate that the damage threshold will scale logarithmically with a uh, repetition rate and that can be seen uh, in this graph over here uh, which is uh, from some data in the literature as far as spot size uh, this shouldn't be an issue if you're working with energy density and linear power density so that's joules per centimeter squared and watts per centimeter as long as your data was taken at a reasonable spot size which typically at least 100 to 200 microns if you have data taken say at a you know 10 or 15 microns you may uh, wind up vastly overestimating your damage threshold as you scale but with larger spot sizes that shouldn't be an issue and then finally um, those of us who are skilled at unit conversions uh, i will occasionally hear something like look you know a watt is just one joule per second so shouldn't i be able to convert between pulsed and cw damage threshold and I mean, yes, a watt is a joule per second, but no, you cannot do that conversion because different mechanisms are at work. Um, yeah, we're dealing with, um, you know, dielectric breakdown and various ionizations versus um, just uh, thermal heating. Thermal effects, excuse me. So, um, yeah, I hope this has been a, a reasonable primer for most of you, but uh, if you're interested in more information, uh, I can recommend uh, some of these books uh, unreservedly. Um, uh, Roger Wood, uh, you know, wrote <clears throat> this uh, this book based on his experience. Um, whereas this is um, kind of a survey of the literature, and there's a lot of good information in here. Um, you can find the, all the proceedings from the SPIE Laser Damage Boulder Conference. Uh, I believe those are all online, so you should be able to find those. Uh, we have a damage threshold tutorial on our Thor Labs website, and uh, if you if any of those are too exciting for you, uh, feel free to look at the ISO standard, <clears throat> which will uh, tell you how to set up one of uh, your own test bed. Um, so yes, uh, I'd like to thank you. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd uh, I'd love to hear them. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, we did yeah, have several questions come in throughout the talk. Um, so you sort of addressed this one on the, the last couple of slides there, but I do think it's a, an important point to sort of reiterate. Um, so Thor Labs, we publish mostly pulsed damage thresholds on the web. Um, if people are using CW lasers, is there any any way to, to um, correlate between the two? Yeah, I mean, uh, as I said, yeah, as I said, uh, no, um, you are always welcome to ask because uh, we do have a even we do have a large repository of of information so even if we don't have your exact component we probably have at least a ballpark idea of how that component is going to perform and we can always send parts out for testing you know whether that's um yeah whether that's for an OEM or whether that's for you know some one customer who bought one you know more information helps us uh, just as much as it helps you so yeah feel free to ask that's that's what I would emphasize. If we don't have what you want, just uh, ask us nicely, and I'm sure we can we can look at that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So our next question here: um, Does laser-induced damage scale or change with angle of incidence? So if the damage was measured at zero degrees AOI, would uh, would you expect the same damage or similar damage threshold at 45 degrees? Um, I believe, uh, I believe so. Um, we tend to have all our parts tested under their use cases. Um, so for example, uh, a mirror that's intended to be used at zero degrees, we test the zero degrees. Um, a, um, a dichroic mirror that's intended for 45 degree usage, we'll have that tested at 45 degrees. So, um, so I wouldn't expect to see too much variation between, um, the tests and use case, but, and I also wouldn't expect too much to change, um, even if you tilt an optic to the quote unquote wrong angle, um, because yeah, the spot size is going to change, but uh, as I cover on this uh, this slide, um, that that shouldn't be too much of an issue. Um, I would have to, I would have to take a look and see if, um, if that would affect uh, how the uh, the electric field uh, is propagating through the coating. So uh, my uh, my initial answer is no, I don't think it should make a difference, but I can look into that further and get back to you. All right, thanks. Um, let's see, so going back to 
um, testing standards. So when dealing with the S on one, um, is there a standard number of shots per site or is that something that's dictated by, by the user? All right, let me just click back. Um, I, I, I want to say it's 10 or 100 per site, but I would have to go double check with the standard. Um, I'm sure um, I can say that I've worked with a number of testing houses uh, worldwide and they've all been very accommodating. So I one would assume that, you know, you can go to them and say, you know, hey, I'd like this optic tested under these exact conditions. And they can say, well, our standard conditions are X. You know, why do you want that? But you can certainly do that. Um, but yeah, I believe it's typically 10, 20, or 100, but I would have to refer to the standard. Um, but if you have, uh, yeah, but if you have a an exact use case that you want, I'm sure that could be accommodated. Sort of continuing on with that and, and damage testing. Um, so if your damage probability curve never reaches 100%, um, let's say some of your points are damaged at a at a low energy fluence, but then you move up to a higher energy fluence and um, see nothing damaged, but you never quite hit that 100%. Um, what does that sort of tell you about, about the damage threshold of your optic? You don't necessarily have to hit 100%. Um, obviously, a general upward trend is, uh, is useful. If you're seeing uh, what seems to be uh, I can't tell if if what you're describing is a relatively random pattern, like you know you see damage at one joule per centimeter squared, and then none da no damage at two, and then damage at three, and then no damage at four. Then uh, I would say you would probably want to look at your process. Um, you you probably have uh, you probably need to do a better job of keeping things clean. Uh, but typically, even if you don't get to a hundred percent, you probably would see eventually an upward trend if there are if there's occasional damage probability. Um, if you do see occasional non-zero damage probability down here, that probably also does mean that you can look at cleanliness. But um, yeah, so that just comes down to, uh, you know, are you comfortable with with something like this, or yeah, do you have uh, defects in your process that are causing uh, damage at uh, a lower fluence than what you should be experiencing? Uh, does that does that make sense? Yeah, I think that gathers the, the gist of the question. Um, all right, so next question um, referring to uh, yeah, AR coatings or um, uncoated substrates. So mm -hmm. is it, if you're concerned about damage thresholds, should you go for uncoated substrates or should you use AR coatings? Uh, I mean, I would, I mean, in, in theory, um, I would, yeah, I would, if I'm, if I'm concerned about damage threshold, I wouldn't want 4% reflection of my high power laser bouncing around my lab. I would always use uh, AR coded parts. Um, yeah, I mean, you can get very high damage thresholds on AR coatings, um, either broadband or, you know, narrow band if necessary. Um, I know that, yeah, something like fused silica is going to typically have a higher value in the bulk, but I would say uh, the uh, utility of having a higher damage threshold is a slightly higher damage threshold than an AR is probably not worth the 4% loss, not to mention um, extra high power beams bouncing around your lab. Yeah, definitely a, a good point to keep in mind. Um, so if the, if the laser is polarized, will that affect the, the damage threshold or will that reduce the damage threshold? Um, well, it will it will always affect the damage threshold, um, particularly when you're if you're use if you're working at non-normal uh, uh, angles of incidence. Um, I've seen one of the more interesting papers I remember reading um, was uh, I guess damage threshold um, of a a polarizer, you know, um, a thin film polarizer that's designed to transmit P polarization and reflect S. And uh, this had this paper had a number of different methods, and uh, different methods produced um, one method would produce a, a high result for transmitting P, and another method would produce a high uh, result for trans for uh, reflecting S. So. Yes, you're, that's something you're going to have to bear in mind for non-normal angles of incidence, and 
uh, yeah, that's something we do try to keep in mind when we test our parts, whether um, whether we're testing uh, the the blocking or or the transmitted beam, depending. So. All right, thanks. Um, so yeah, we've got time for a few more questions here. Um, yeah, is there any particular reason why Thor Labs doesn't test in the femtosecond regime as as much as we do in the nanosecond or CW regimes? Uh, a lot of that has been customer demand. Um, we are we are seeing more uh, more requests in the the picosecond and the femtosecond regime, so we have started doing some more testing. Um, but yeah, all, all of this is driven by demand. It's not it's not like we're saying that work isn't done there or that work isn't valuable. It's just um, more people have asked for the uh, for the other results, and as more people ask for picosecond and femtosecond results, then we're going to um, test those more and post that more on the website. Yeah, yeah, definitely a good point to reiterate is if, yeah, if you don't see what you what you want, please ask and, and we'll do our best to get you get you an answer. All right, let's see. Next question here. Um, is it possible to have coding damage that affects the laser beam at one particular wavelength, but at other wavelengths you might see that it behaves as expected? Um, sure, I don't see uh, I mean uh as uh, as I kind of uh, touch on, you know, here your laser damage threshold is going to change with um, with laser wavelength, and so yes, yeah, some of that could be um, some of that could be intrinsic to the substrate with something like absorption. Um, you know, some materials have absorption peaks um, at several close. Uh, some materials have absorption peaks close. To, uh, to laser wavelengths. So if you have a tunable laser, you could see you know, damage in your substrate or damage in your coating with one wavelength, and then a few nanometers off that, you wouldn't see an issue. Um, is that, um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I, th I think it might also be sort of trying to get at maybe if your optic is damaged and you see distortion at one wavelength, if you use that same optic at a different wavelength, would you see that same Sort of distortion would you expect yeah that, that damage to to show up everywhere well uh i mean since it's an irreversible physical change you know some if i drill a if i drill a hole in a lens uh with a 1064 laser i'm still going to see that with visible light you know so uh yeah there yeah, are absolutely all right and let's see we've got a, yeah a couple more questions here and then we'll have to to close out um, so similar to the um, testing of pulsed lasers, we have a question asking during the CW test, is there a set um, lasing time or a set amount of time where you expose the optic to that laser before you determine that it's not going to be damaged? Well, uh, as much as I want to say, because a CW laser doesn't have a pulse, uh, the only true test would be indefinite. Uh, I believe that's also laid out in the ISO standard and Typically, uh, you see 30 seconds to a minute used. Um, I mean, I'm sure obviously uh, testing houses would be willing to accommodate longer times if necessary. I mean, All right. uh, yeah, most of the results I have are 30 seconds or 60 seconds. So let's stick okay. with that. Excellent. <laughs> All right, and our last question here for today. Um, would you recommend using nano textured fused silica optics to mitigate laser damage? Uh, I mean, I've seen some, I've seen a little bit of the literature on nano textured silica optics. And uh, was that silica or silicon? Silica. Okay. Um, I mean, I've seen a little bit of the literature on that. I'm not sure if I have seen anything saying that. Um, that a nano textured optic is going to have better uh, damage threshold than a an AR coated optic, but um, yeah, I mean if you if you can get better test results on one or the other, or if you're or if you're uh, able to buy that from someone who says yeah we've tested this and it's better than an AR, you know feel free to use it. Uh, I would uh, yeah I just want to see the data. I I haven't seen the data. That doesn't mean it's not out there. So. Right. But yes, that, um, we're gonna. Sorry, I just one more sorry, second. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> um, go ahead. 
I believe the nano textured silica is going to have uh, worse damage threshold than just pure bulk fused silica, but it's still going to be very high, I think. But again, I would have to see the numbers. Right, right. Uh, so yeah, with that, we will have to um, wrap up here. Uh, thank you everybody so much for attending. I hope uh, this was useful information for you. Um, if your question was not addressed, please reach out to our technical support group and we can get you an answer. Um, and yeah, thank you very much and we'll see you at the next webinar.